fallible, we're imperfect, but then we're also limited in our capacity. But mm -hmm. if we have that whole village principle, if mm -hmm. our yard might not be humongous, but if we got 20 yards in the neighborhood that the kids can play in. Exactly. Right? You know, we got or, a football field. You that's know? it. And we got a football field, right? Or if mm -hmm. we our attention may be limited due to work or whatever, but if we mm -hmm. got three or four or five or ten other parents up the street who got their eyes looking out the window while they washing dishes or something, paying attention to what's going on, we can relax a little bit and get what we need to get done because we mm -hmm. know in our heart or in our mind that our kids are fine. What's happening, y'all? This is Mike D with Black Fathers Now. Well, we're bringing the village to the brothers. Every couple of weeks, you can look forward to a quick inspirational message or a thought-provoking guest with knowledge and wisdom all geared towards helping you be the best father that you can be. We're bringing the village to you. Now is your turn to do something with what you learn. All right, y'all. Let's go. What's going on, fellas? This is Mike D, Mr. Double Down on You, with another episode of Black Fathers Now. Now, check this out, man. We're going to have a really awesome conversation with a brother who's making an impact in the area on the West Coast in San Diego. We got my man, Coach T, a.k.a. Tyrell Richard Sr., and he's a father of two. He's a co-author of a new book. We're going to jump into that. Um, he's a youth football coach. Like I mentioned before, he's currently in the San Diego area, but he's originally from the Bay. Was an E40 set straight up from the Bay. Hey, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, area. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And but what's interesting about it is our previous conversation really turned into like an impromptu, almost coaching session in which we identified a superpower that he has living inside of him that he really has not explored yet. And we'll dive into that a little bit as well. But fellas and ladies tuning in too, we have my man Tyrell Richards Sr., a.k.a. Coach T in the building. How you doing, man? Hey, what's going on, man? I'm happy to be here, man. I'm happy. The sun is shining. I'm feeling good, man. I'm looking good. Uh, you know, what can I say, man? I'm happy to be here with you. That's awesome, man. And what I'm happy for you to take time out of your schedule. And again, like I said, you're West Coast. We're recording this early. So a brother had to get up a little early, didn't you? Yeah, I got up a little <laughs> early. Got up a little early. That's okay, though. That's all but right. look here, man. I appreciate you feeling the fact that we're worth it, man. So thank you so much for sharing with us today, brother. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. And so before we jump into your story, before we jump into your journey, I like to do shout outs because who are we without those people that end up being the wind beneath our wings, right? You know, what is it? The African proverb that states, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I might have the wording off of that a little bit, mm -hmm. but the reality is we need to make sure that we highlight those around us that mm -hmm. serve as the wind beneath our wings. Give some shout outs, brothers, before we, brother, before we jump into your story. Hey, first and foremost, my, I got to give a, uh... Shout out to the Lord and Savior, you know, Absolutely. without him, there is no me, Absolutely. you know, my mother and father, you know, been through their things, but I believe did a good job in bringing me up and teaching me right and wrong. Uh, of course, I got to shout out my lady who supports me, Robin, you know, who supports me all along, uh, you know, my kids, you know, to keep me strong, keep me pushing. Uh, you know, what can I say, man? These are the people that help me do what I do. And I don't want to forget my man, uh, Daryl Thomas, you know, he's uh, helped me come along. He's helping me get my things together. He's coaching me up. So, you know, I want to shout out to that brother as well. Mm. So, it's good yeah. stuff, man. And you mentioned, you mentioned obviously, you know, your, your lady, your, your better half, your kids, your parents, and mm -hmm. your coach, right? And it's interesting, right. you know, we think about the concept of coaching. Every player that's Hall of Fame, anything, has a coach right? Just about anybody who's making impact in the world in some capacity has a coach, meaning we can't always see everything through our own eyes. So that's why it's right. good at times to have another set of eyes there to see things and see around corners that maybe you're not aware of. So it's interesting, but it's also powerful that you threw that into the mix in regards to your shout out. So salutes to you, my man. 
Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, man. Appreciate no it. No doubt. And, and so you mentioned your, your, you know, your, your support system, but now let's jump into your story, man. Let's go to your origin story, man. Talk to us a little bit about yourself growing up, some of your experiences growing up in the Bay and, you know, some of those things that led to the man that you are today, brother. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, like I said, I was born in Oakland, California. The first uh, early part of my life, you know, uh, grew up in Oakland. And in the life of Oakland, it's kind of like, uh, how do I say, your family, even though you're not family, mm. you know. I remember when I was young and my parents first told me that, you know, we were going to be leaving. We were mm. going to be moving from Oakland. I'm like, wow, you know, I was maybe eight years old, 10 years old. And that hit me hard as like, man, I don't want to leave, you know, I don't want to leave. You know, we lived on this small street and, you know, we knew everybody on the block. And it was like, even though they weren't family by blood, it was family by neighborhood, you know. Mm. And um, to me, that was really, it was really, uh, I don't even know the words to say. It was like, you kind of taking me out of my home, mm. you know. And then again, I think, okay, maybe I'm just young and don't understand, but no, there's really something about, uh, and everyone that's from the Bay Area can tell you this. There's really something about being from the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Now, like I say, and not, like I said, you know, it was the first eight or ten years of my life, so I didn't completely grow up in the Bay Area. But when you think about the Bay Area and specifically Oakland, um, there really is a family about Oakland. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. just where you grew up, how you feel. It's um, it's a different vibe, you know, it's a different vibe. So, uh, you know, Oakland, we moved out to uh, Newark, California, suburbs, you know, different kind of scenario, a lot of different ethnic groups out there, you know, and all actually, you know, school system is a little bit better, you know, and, um, you know, it was kind of shocking to me from going from being in Oakland where it was predominantly black in my neighborhood to going to uh, out in Newark where there, a multitude of ethnicities, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a uh, wow, you know, as a young guy, like, wow, this is different, mm -hmm. you know. But I adapted, you know, like every kid does, he adapted, <clears throat> grew up, <clears throat> excuse me, grew up there, uh, elementary school, junior high, high school, you know, and adapted well, adapted well. I, um, I like Newark. Uh, I really have a heart for the Bay Area, no mm -hmm. doubt. I'm in San Diego, California now. Don't get me wrong. I love San Diego. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's something about the Bay Area. There's something about uh, the origins of Oakland that resonate with you. you mm. know, I can very well say that I'm from, from Newark, you know, but I feel, mm. you know, the feeling is, you know, I was born and raised in Oakland, even though the majority of my time was uh, in Newark. You know, yeah. just... I want to throw something there, man. It's interesting. You um, when you said that it made me recollect back to a quote from I think it's Maya Angelou, where she says, I don't always remember what you say or do, but you will always remember how people made you feel. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't you don't always remember what people say or what they do, but you always will remember how they make you feel. And it's interesting right. how you mention or you have such an affinity for Oakland. And it mm -hmm. wasn't what someone said or what someone did. It was how Oakland made you feel. And right. and that's and that's interesting because that to me is, the, you know, when I think about that, I think about relationships. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you don't feel things from entities or people that you don't have a relationship with. There right. was an intimate relationship with you in the city of Oakland, which right. gives you that feeling where you only spent eight years there, but yet that's still home to you. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and as a kid growing up in Oakland, I remember we had this uh, plum tree in the mm -hmm. front yard. Okay. And as a kid, you know, my friends and I would climb up the tree and eat the plums and you know, eventually have a stomach ache because we ate too many plums, but mm -hmm. it was, it was really home to me, you know, really home to me. And as a child, you know, we used to play, uh, you know, football, you know, like every kid does. But where we lived, there was an area where there was grass in front of the house, and then there was a cement walkway, and mm -hmm. then there was a driveway, and then there was the next house with uh, cement, uh, cement driveway and grass. So, 
and you know it was kind of like on a little hill so we would play you know football on this little area up and down the street you know my house the neighbor's house the mm. neighbor's house after that neighbor's house after that and it was just fun it was like man this is life this is what it really is you know and see those those things right those things i'll never forget because it made me feel like this is home outside this is family outside of my blood family you know what i mean you look across the street and i'm not going to call out any any you know any family's names but there was the the older family mm-hmm. that had been there longer than us you know 20 or 30 years now we're talking back in 1970-ish you know what mm-hmm. i'm saying it's mm-hmm. a long time ago you can name the different families that live there on the corner i'm not going to mention the names but on the corner there's another family it's just like uh it's it's really strange because it felt like family and home even though they weren't blood flame you know and i think a lot of and i think a lot of times now there is not the same feeling of family and the same feeling of, you know, as, as, as an example, as an example, if I was screwing up in the neighborhood, it was okay for Miss such and such to whoop my butt. Mm-hmm. Mm. And she would tell mom or dad. And they would and do the I, same thing. <laughs> exactly. You know, so it was like, it was this tight knit neighborhood. You weren't going to screw up much mm-hmm. without mom or dad knowing. It was, it was just the way it was. Brother, that's the village. You know, that's the village. Man. That's, you, you know, and it's interesting. And, and I love you really going in depth because it made me recollect to my growing up. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm just a couple of years younger than you. So I'm growing up in the 80s into the 90s. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting mm-hmm. is we had that same feeling as well. It was just like you play in from yard to yard to yard, from this house to that house. It was just like this whole neighborhood was your front yard. Right. Exactly. All the neighbors looked out for you. You were playing in the street. Somebody's calling your mama. Hey, you know, Mike and the boys are out in the street. Or if you're doing something wrong, but, you know, before you get home, yeah. somebody, your mama didn't got the message. Like, I know what you were doing. You want to tell me or do I need to, you know, tell you what I already <laughs> know? Like it was it was that village principle. And I think to your point, that's so interesting, because, again, this is black fathers now. And mm-hmm. black meaning we have like an African lineage, right? There's mm-hmm. something about us that's connected to the continent of Africa. And when you go back to the African principle of it takes a village to raise a child or mm-hmm. it takes a whole village, that's the thing. It takes a whole village to mm-hmm. raise a child. It's like sometimes we buy more so into this idealism of, of individualist, just nuclear family of just me, my wife and my kids. I do everything, we do everything forget everybody else, it's on us 100%. But mm-hmm. historically speaking, from us culturally, it was designed to be mm-hmm. that village where, right. and, and I think I think God works in ways that he knows that. And that's why he, you know, inspired the concept of it takes a village to raise a child because mm-hmm. he knows that we're fallible, we're imperfect, but then we're also limited in our capacity. But mm-hmm. if we have that whole village principle, if, mm-hmm. Our yard might not be humongous, but if we got 20 yards in the neighborhood that the kids can play in. Exactly. Right? You know, we got or, a football field. You that's know? it. <laughs> we got a football field, right? Or if mm-hmm. we, our attention may be limited due to work or whatever, but if we mm-hmm. got three or four or five or 10 other parents up the street who got their eyes looking out the window while they washing dishes or something, paying attention to what's going on, we can relax a little bit and get what we need to get done because we mm-hmm. know in our heart or in our mind that our kids are fine. Right, right. You know, as a, as, a, as a kid, I can remember my mother sending me to the store to get eggs or milk. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, I'm eight years old, 10 years old. Mm-hmm. The store is a couple blocks away. You know, I don't even believe that parents send their kids to the store to go get milk and eggs walking, that is. Mm-hmm. You know, you know the, the teenagers and the older uh, children, maybe. But we was eight, 10 years old walking to the store. There was, mm. there, it was like, there was no, um, mom needed some milk or some eggs or some bread. Go to the store, here go some money, go to the store and get it. She knows it's going to take you 15 minutes at most to get mm. around the corner and come back. And it was really no big deal. You know, it was really no big deal. So I think today we miss that type of, um, that type of, and, and I'll just say it, family. We miss that type of thing. The simple things, you know, the real simple things, 
You know, it's 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 interesting. And, um, you know, I can remember um, uh, having a conversation with uh, my mother and we, we were talking about my mother made a comment that, you know, that rap music you guys listen to, you know, it's no good or, you know, because it had profanity, you know, and I, and I understand that. I'm a parent now. I, you know, I kind of think you get it now. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So it, it the, the point I'm making is parents and their kids, they, you know, growing up in different times. But one thing is, this, is the same. The thing is the same as parents have a different idea or a different concept of what a child should be listening to in their music and how it affects them. Mm. You know, so now today, you know, of course, there's rap music and I'm like, man, why, you know, Mm-hmm. Why are you listening to that? Why, you know, it doesn't, it, it's, it, now don't get me wrong. I like rap music. I, I like rap music, but I like R&B more. I like jazz more. You know, I think maybe my, you know, music has developed, mm-hmm. but it's, it's interesting. I had the conversation with my mother. I had the conversation with my kids. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And I would assume that my parents probably had it with their parents. You Absolutely. Know? So it, it kind of goes in generations, maybe, you know, but, you, but check this out, man. So when, when you're saying that, it's, it's, you know, you as a person who's experienced a little bit of life has mm-hmm. more insight into the impact of some of the things that someone who maybe has not lived as much life, they, they don't they don't have that, like, that level of perspective, right? right. And so as you think about it, I mean, it's the same thing from, you know, when having a mentor who's been around the block a little bit, who's been around a few of these turns can see like, hey, Mike, this is what's coming just so that, you know, here's a way to prepare for that, because this is what I dealt with. Right. Mm-hmm. Even and I might, you know, be going full speed ahead, not thinking about it because I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I don't know. And so yeah. I think to your point, generationally, that's important. But then on the flip side, each generation also doesn't listen too well because we go through this. <laughs> it's like it's this cycle that continuously, you know, it keeps going back and forth. I raised my hand. I yeah, did this oh, all I the time. You know? my, my feet, my toes, everything, man. Because I, I right. didn't listen, you know. But then now, as a parent, I see it, and I'm like, ooh, the impact of these influences. And speaking of influences, I know during our last conversation, you talked about how you know you ended up going to as you became an older teenager into like young adulthood. You know, things happen, but you ended up getting a chance to spend more time with your father, and yeah. how those moments really mm. left a lasting impression on you. And mm. that kind of led to this undiscovered superpower that's been right. laying dormant inside of you. Talk to right. us a little bit about the experience of those last few years with your father mm. and, um, and then what, what that now has, has kind of inspired you to do. Right, yeah. So um, I think I was roughly uh, 20 years old. Yeah, 20 years or so. I went to live with my dad. He lived in Reno, Nevada, you know, Need to say I was screwing up in the Bay Area, mm-hmm. you know, and I called him up one day, you know, and here's one thing I want to say this and I want to make this real clear. It's real. It's important. This is important. Mm-hmm. So my parents, you know, divorced. OK, so for the most part, I live with my mom, but never once did my mom ever speak bad about my dad. Mm-hmm. So that's important to know. Mm-hmm. And I say that because I never had ill feelings for my dad. I just knew he wasn't in the house. Mm-hmm. So. When I got ready, I screwed up, you know, when I was 20 years old, screwing up, I gave him a call. Hey, dad, you know, can I come, can I come stay with you? You know, <clears throat> and of course, dad being dad, he gave me, read me the riot act. He's like, hey, you can't come up here screwing up. You can't do this. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. The same thing that you're doing down there is up here. Don't think you're running from the neighborhoods. And uh-huh. So I'm like, wow. So I had to hear all that. Like, dad, that's not, that's not it. I'm coming up there get myself right i'm screwed up i want to get i'm going back to school i'm gonna do this stuff i had a plan i had a vision you know and 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 i was focused you know i made up my mind okay i need to get my stuff together need to say um went to live with dad and i discovered that my dad and i had a really good relationship i discovered that we were almost the same person Mm. i discovered that i was so much like him and i discovered that man this guy has a wealth of knowledge it's like he's like in a walking encyclopedia to me Mm, mm. and although i was young and i wasn't i was kind of half listening and kind of half i really was listening Mm -hmm. so when it appears that you know i'm I'm, 
you know, and, and I can imagine, and I can imagine, I'm sitting there like, mm-hmm. dad's giving me this lecture, mm-hmm. got to listen to this, be quiet, and then I'm going about my business, but I was mm-hmm. listening, so um, my dad and I got really close, we got really tight, and uh, I was, a couple of things that really stood out for me, he was like, you know, come on in here, boy, and let me show you how to cook. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I know how to cook. Nah, get in here. I'm going to show you how to cook. So my idea was cooking. I made hamburgers and hot dogs. Mm-hmm. Right? I can cook. That was my idea. Because, nah, nah, nah. We're going to teach you how to make spaghetti. We're going to teach you how to make these nice salads. We're going to teach you how to make steak. We're going to teach you how to make breakfast. You like to eat, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you need to know how to cook, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. <clears throat> so I learned to cook really well with him. And then he told me a story about his parents. Mm his parents that really resonated with me and it made sense. He hit me like, wow, that's deep. So he told me the story about his dad and his, uh, uh, well, stepmother, but he said that his dad only knew how to cook grits and eggs. Mm -hmm. The wife did all the cooking. So they, you know, had a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. She decided she wasn't going to cook. So, my dad tells me that his dad ate grits and eggs for two weeks because he couldn't cook. <laughs> couldn't cook anything now, else. He could, now, I don't know. Maybe he's, you know, maybe he's making a point about cooking. Uh-huh. Maybe that wasn't the complete truth. I uh-huh. don't know. But it hit me as well. I don't want to eat grits and eggs for two weeks. There I you go. To learn how to cook. There and I go. like to eat. So, uh-huh. you know, it, 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 made, it made a point. It drove home a point for me. Uh-huh. It drove home a point for me. So <clears throat> I discovered living with my dad that, you know, we were really, really tight and over the years i think he kind of caught on to that also you know i kind of i i think well i can't say i think i know my dad and i had a tighter relationship than any of the others Mm. me and my siblings here's one thing that um living with my dad uh i decided when i was younger that i'm going to get me a leather lazy board chair just like the one my dad has when I get my place, mm-hmm. because we both like watching football. Sunday morning, we get up, you know, whoever got up first, got to the lazy boy chair, had the lazy boy chair for football. Mm-hmm. You know, that was our thing. You know, Sunday, we was watching football, talking and, you know, doing what we do. So that was kind of our bonding time. Okay. Um, I went to live with my dad. I kind of came into my own, you know, uh, started lifting weights, getting all buff and strong and, you know, feeling real good. Went back to school, man, studying electronics. Um, girlfriend or or three, you know, it really was, you know, re- really, really coming into my own. Mm-hmm. And my dad has watched me develop and it's like, man, it was like this, this, I don't even know how to explain it. I felt good about myself. Mm-hmm. My dad felt good about what's going on because I was screwing up before I'm there. I told him what I was going to do and mm-hmm. now I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. Right? So I'm going to school every day. You know, uh, one of the instructors at the school, Offered me a job at the school. Mm. You know, I came home to him and said, Hey, Dad, you know, the instructor such and such asked me that I want to, you know, work part time. He mm-hmm. said, What'd you say? I said, Of course I want to work part time. So now I'm going to school. I'm lifting weights, looking good, feeling good about myself. I got me a part time job. Uh, my dad has let me drive his car, you know, so mm-hmm. it's like things are great. So I'm feeling good. My dad is feeling good. And we have this relationship that is just, just, it's great. I was a young guy coming into my own. And my dad was pouring into me. He was he was giving me knowledge. He was telling me things that was going to happen. And although I pretended that I wasn't listening, mm-hmm. or I, paying I, didn't, attention. I was paying attention. I was mm-hmm. paying attention. So mm-hmm. now, as now as an adult and having my own kids, I'm like, wow. Um, dad knew what he was talking about. Mm. He knew what he was talking about. And and you know it's the same with my kids. When I talk to them, you know. You know, they're, you know, on their phone or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, they put that dog on phone down, listen, right? So I'm thinking they are listening, although it may appear to me that they're not listening. That's right. You know? But just so, keep going. Yeah. And then, and I know, like, in our last conversation, you mentioned that you were getting all of this good stuff. Like, it was like you were coming into your own, but then you ended up losing him. Yeah, yeah. Talk so, to me about that, man. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, uh, lifting weights, you know, I, I actually won a, a, a weightlifting competition for the apartment complex. It was a pretty big part of it. That was a, a major achievement for me because, okay. uh, you know, I won this contest, 
and that I'm feeling so good about myself. You know, I got to talk to a couple of my buddies in the Bay Area. One p- particular uh, friend had been in the Navy, mm-hmm. right? So we got to tell him he was on battleship such and such. I was like, wow, you know, Navy traveler. That mm-hmm. might be kind of cool, you know? Mm-hmm. So I'm feeling good about it. So I enlisted in the Navy, right? Mm-hmm. End up end up going to the Navy, ended up being on a battleship, just mm-hmm. like my friend was. And um, in 1991, <clears throat> I got a message from the chaplain on board and he came to me and he says, hey, you know, your, your father has, uh, he's in the hospital. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, you know, what's, what's wrong with that? You know, he had a stroke. I'm like, well, hey, look, I need to get home. I need to go see dad. You know, I need I need to get out of here. So mm-hmm. my command at the time says, no, we can't let you go. Um, you know, it's just it's just not able to be done. Now, I got I got mixed feelings about that. No, mm-hmm. let, let me just say it. I got ill feelings about that. Absolutely. Because, because in at that time I was on a battleship and we had helos that go on and off the ship, you know, regularly. So if this had been a captain or an exo, they'd have got them off the ship to get to their parents. So, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, that's... Yeah, it's real, that's real, though. That's a very real... And it's okay to share, you know, your feelings right. about that. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> and then maybe a week later, uh, the chaplain comes back to me again and says, you know what, uh, well, let me back up. So, they tell me that they can't get me off the ship right now, but once we hit Hawaii in... Uh, I think we want to hit Hawaii, like, in two weeks. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Once we get to Hawaii, we'll get you home. I'm like, nah, it's not good enough. I need to go, right? So about a week later, the chapter comes to me again and says, hey, you know, your dad had another stroke. Your dad's passed. I'm like, oh, man. So, of course, I'm feeling, you know, some kind yeah. of way. I'm mad at you know, everyone on the ship. Absolutely. You know, I, I should have been home. <sighs> so I get to Hawaii. Uh, I get, you know, make it back home. You know, they made arrangements for me to fly back home. Uh, I get there. And um, I like to think of myself as being, you know, strong, you know, got my stuff together. But when I saw my dad laying there in the casket for the viewing, I was like, uh, you know, it, you know, I cried. I cried like a kid. You know? mm-hmm. Like, man, I wasn't here. You know, I wasn't I wasn't here, you know. So uh, needless to say, um, <clears throat> That was a rough time for me. Let's just put it like that. That was a rough time for me. I felt like a part of me had died with my dad. I felt like there was so much more, mm. so much more I had to learn. There was so much more we were to experience. Uh, my dad never got a chance to meet my kids. Mm. I didn't have the opportunity to, um, you know, bring my kids to his house or dad come to my house. Mm-hmm. You know, I just feel there's just so much more that he would have taught me mm-hmm. even though i'm a young man and you know i'm doing my thing i feel like there's just so much more that i feel like there's a missing piece mm. there's something missing you know what i mean there's mm-hmm. something missing because <clears throat> there's something missing because my dad in my opinion he's a great man you know i don't you know i really don't care what others have to say good or bad. I know to me, he was a father to me. He looked out for me. He taught me things that I probably wouldn't have learned. Well, maybe I would have learned, but Mm -hmm. my dad, I'm going to teach you this, whether you want to know it or not. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm going to prepare you for what's about to happen, you know? And I felt like even though he died in 1991, what could he have taught me in 2001 Mm. or 2011? Or 2021, you know what I mean? Man, look, and I think this this is interesting because this is what you know we briefly spoke about in you know our last conversation, mm. and one of the things that you know we have to work on in regards to life is like we can be sad, you know, we can be upset, we can be frustrated, we can be pissed off. That's okay. Those are emotions that we're supposed to have. They're there for a reason, right? Because we right. have these different things in our life, but we're also people and you know like you mentioned you're a man of faith as well nothing happens by accident everything happens for a reason and we've also been given everything that we need to move forward and so Mm -hmm. when our conversation happened last time one of the things that I shared with you was he didn't leave you too early he basically wrote the intro to the book that you're supposed to write Mm -hmm. 
he gave you that jump start. Mm -hmm. In essence, was the prompt for everything that you're supposed to do. And you're one that's capable of taking all of these stories. If you go deep enough to find these mm -hmm. things that are there, these concepts, these principles that helped you, you can now take them, reimagine them and release them to, you know, to the world or help somebody, or, you know, we call you coach T because you're into mentoring and, and coaching young men. And you said that you are just like your father or you saw your father in you. And what's mm -hmm. so interesting, I would bet that, that that's not a mistake in a sense that you probably are a splitting image of a lot of what you will remember about your father. And those things are now getting poured into this next generation that you're coaching, mm -hmm. mentoring, that you know, when you put you poured yourself out in a chapter of this book that you're a co-author on, all mm -hmm. of that, those things were remnants of your father. Right, right, right. You know, it's, it's interesting. One time um, I, I posted a picture uh, on social media and I had let my, you know, my beard come in a little bit and, you know, it's a little fuller and it was gray. And uh, my sister and my nephew mm -hmm. both said, you know, my nephew was like, man, you look just like just like Richard. They called him Richard, right? Mm -hmm. You look just like Richard. I'm looking at the man I'm like, I'm looking at the man I'm like, I don't see it. Okay, but I'm looking at the gram like, okay, I, I can see it. You know, I can see mm -hmm. how he had his and mine. So it was like, wow, you know, and thinking about it, I'm like, you know what, I do have a lot of his his ways. And it's it's mm -hmm. just, I don't know, it's, it's remarkable to me. It's just, you know, like you said, you know, maybe this is the intro to the next story, but mm -hmm. man, this for me in my heart, I feel, you know, it's a void, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, something's missing there. I mean, we can't sit and watch football, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, here, here, here's a, here's a, just a little tidbit. My dad uh, was really into, uh, he liked, you know, R and B music and, you know, and uh, you know, he had his stereo, mm -hmm. right. Now he wouldn't go buy a new stereo. Mm -mm. He had the money to buy a new stereo. He liked his stereo, mm -hmm. his cassettes, mm -hmm. you know. And you know, you you can tell him, I like, you know, Dad, you know, we can go get something new, you know, something, mm -hmm. you know. Now he's like, mm, leave my stereo alone. Mm -hmm. Listen, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna play my music on my stereo. What oh, I, yeah, want. I want, it. and <laughs> you know what I mean. And you know, when I, when I when I think about it, like. As old as I'm older now, I get it. I get it. I mean, you know, I have a you know, I have a stereo that's dated, mm -hmm. but I'm not gonna go and run and get the latest thing. You know, some of the stuff now, you know, in all honesty, I can't even you know operate all the electronics now. You know, <laughs> so uh -huh. maybe I'm telling maybe I'm telling my age right now. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, but I, you know, I get it. As I'm older and as I'm maturing, I'm noticing things in myself. That was just like my dad, you know. Oh, that, that's that. As you age, you notice things in yourself that are just like your dad. And you mentioned before how there was an image that you posted that your siblings and other family members said you reminded them of your father. You yeah. didn't see it. And I want to throw something out here. You don't have to see it when you are it. Mm -hmm. Wow. You don't That's have deep. to see it That's if you deep. are it. It's, it's so interesting, unless you're looking at a mirror, do you ever see yourself? No. You see what I'm saying? It's like you look out from yourself. Mm -hmm. Others see this thing, mm -hmm. but you don't see yourself. You see outward, right? You see right, the things right. that you encounter. And so you don't have to see it when you are it, right? Mm -hmm. And so to that point, that's just a, it, it's just like, Every so often we have to dig into these things and really search because a lot of times we feel like there's a void, but that thing is sitting right here with us and you might not see it because you are it. Wow. That's, that's deep, man. I, I never, I never looked at it from that point. I never looked at it from that perspective, mm -hmm. but that's deep. Now you, now you got me thinking, you know, man, um, that's interesting, man, because because as I was coming up again, I, I keep going back to this because uh, my dad would, you know, would and I call it lecture, mm. but he was giving me his his ideas, his knowledge. Mm. And I'm kind of like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, 
jumps off. What do you do to this day? Yeah, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's the same thing, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to give my kids all the information that I have, all the knowledge that I have, all the wisdom that, that I've gained over the years. You are it. Yeah. It appears to me that my kids are living, but they are. They are. It's just young people. Young mm-hmm. people. This is how we this is how we act as young mm-hmm. people. But as an adult, I gotta give you what I know. I have to pour into you. I yeah. have to. I yeah. won't feel right unless I give you the understanding and the knowledge that I've gained over my 50 years or whatever. You know what I mean? I have to give it to you. Man. I'm not gonna feel comfortable <laughs> if I don't share what I know. Man, you are it. Like I anytime that you feel that there's a void there you probably need to keep a mirror somewhere close to you and realize that you are it. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, the void that you feel at time, dude, that void, that, it's really not a void because you are it. That thing is full. It's mm-hmm. full of so much. Like we could probably sit here and talk for hours Man. about all the lessons and the things that, and if you really just really go deep, it could probably go on for days about the lessons learned, the things you were inspired by, the stuff that you picked up on, the things that were told to you, the things that you had to infer from just observing, but probably could go on for days. You are it. And, and that being said, you know, it's funny, a lot of these things come out in ways that we've never even thought about, right? And mm-hmm. when I mentioned coming out in communication and putting things out there, you are co-author of a book on fatherhood, right? Yes. So so talk to me a little bit about the book, this project, how it came together, but then mm-hmm. a little bit about what it is you contributed to this particular project. Right, yeah. So the book is called When the Walls Speak. It is a collaboration of fathers uh, with one goal. One goal, one collective goal, and that is to uplift, motivate, and inspire the youth of today. Mm. That's the that's the goal in it. And what we've done is we had taken different fathers and taken their experiences and their upbringings, maybe as a father or as a child, and we poured it into this book. And the the thought process is to inspire a youngster, inspire the youth to know and understand that they are essential and no matter where they come from their backgrounds you know hardships that they too can be successful they can't succeed in life so this book is designed to help a young person get through whatever it is they're getting through this is uh, like a movement i want i'm talking to you today about the book Mm -hmm. so the hope is that you know i can talk to someone else maybe you Mm -hmm. will talk to someone Mm -hmm. and these 13 men that have decided, you know what, let's, let's, let's collaborate. Let's talk about our experiences. Let's, let's help the next generation get to where they need to be. Mm-hmm. You know, because as a, as a youth football coach, I see kids coming to the football field and I see them that, you know, they're a little distracted or they're a little, you know, standoffish. And I know, I know, listen to what I'm saying, Mike, I know that some of these kids' homes lives are not the greatest. Mm-hmm. Now I've had to pick up kids and drop off kids, you mm-hmm. know, from practice to practice, whatever. And sometimes you can see this kid is is, is having a rough time, mm-hmm. you know. But I also noticed that those couple hours on the football field helps a kid come out of whatever it is, even if it's for only those two hours. Mm-hmm. Even if it's for those only two hours, or however however long it is, um, it helps. And I also know as a parent and as a child, if your parent says something to you that, you know, you may believe or may not believe uh, as a child, you may take it in or may not. But the exact same, the exact same message can come from a coach, uh, an uncle, Mm -hmm. a teacher, Mm -hmm. and it resonates different with that child. Mm -hmm. I've heard it. I've seen it with my own kids. Mm. I've heard it and seen it with my own kids. I will tell them, you know, and I'm not going to get into any details. I will tell them, look, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. Okay, Dad. Right. But then a friend of mine will say something very similar, almost identical. And here goes this ongoing conversation back and forth between my son and a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. What the heck? Like I said the same thing and it didn't resonate. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So, 
you know. Hold on, so hold on, think- pause, pause for a second there. You know, I'm, I'm gonna throw something because this goes back to what you said earlier in the story, right? Mm-hmm. You, we talked about growing up in Oakland. Mm-hmm. What was that thing that you felt growing up in Oakland? It was family, man. It was it was the village. Family. That village. Yeah. Yeah, that village and the design mm. of the village. See, you see how this thing called comes together. The mm. design of the village is, you know, I think God knows that mama and daddy can't do everything. They mm. know that teenage so and so or ten year old so and so might not listen to mom and dad, but they might listen to the uncle so and so or coach whoever or neighbor that they look up to, mm. saying the same thing, and so. Mm. I don't really care where the message comes from if it's the right message, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and it's interesting you say that how this thing comes full circle, how Mm -hmm. I might say it, they don't listen to me, but let the neighbor say it, let the coach say it, (laughs) let somebody Mm -hmm. they look up to say it, and it's like the best thing since sliced bread. Right, right, right. You know, it it, it reminds me, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, I I, want to say this. So I remember uh, one of the parents of... uh, you know, one of the kids I was coaching uh, mm-hmm. two years ago, she came to me before practice. She was like, hey, little such and such has not been doing his work and he's kind of acting up at school. Would you mind ha- having a word with him? Mm-hmm. Right? So absolutely, no problem. So I had the whole, you know, the whole football team sitting there, had him take a knee and uh, I didn't point him out directly. But I said, hey, guys, you know, we're student athletes out here in the field. Mm-hmm. Student is first. You must maintain your grades, you must give your best effort, right? Mm-hmm. And as in, as I'm saying it, I made a point to make eye contact with him as mm-hmm. I'm saying it. Now I'm scanning the the the, the whole crowd of, of students, but I'm making a point that I know that you haven't been doing your best. So he's looking at me with his eyes wide open, and he, you know, yeah, I understand, right? So needless to say, um, about you know near the ending of the season, uh, the parent came back to me. She says, "Well, you know." He's doing much better now. I'm not going to mention his name. He's doing much better now. So I don't know if it had anything to do with what I said to him. Mm-hmm. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. The point is he got back on track. And really? the point is I like to think that, you know, maybe, you know, coach being upset at his performance led to him like, well, man, I need to get it together. Or the coach bitch. may not let me play my position. Or the coach bitch. may not let me play as much as I normally would. The so, village. Yeah. The village, brother. Like everything, everything that you're saying, I can just all I just repeat the village. Like that's yeah. that's and fellas, I hope y'all are paying attention to the impact of the village. Like, brother coach T said that you know his dad had a major impact, his mom had an impact, his his coach has an impact on him, but he also talked about the value of the village, right? And even in the writing or the co-authoring of this book, When the Walls Speak, is 13 men inspiring youth or inspiring young men or inspiring young folks that are coming of age to really look at life through different lenses or examples so that they can then approach or attack these issues that are going to come their way in a way that's constructive, right? But When the Walls Speak is, in essence, a collaboration of a village, right? And Coach T... Brother Tyrell Richards was author of a chapter of that. Don't tell yeah. us everything about it, but give us like a little snippet about your chapter in that particular book. Yeah, so my chapter is, is real personal for me. It's real personal for me. So it kind of goes into some of the struggles I've had as a parent. Now, I'm pouring into this book from a parent's perspective, mm-hmm. from a parent's perspective. And, uh, and and I'll just give you this this little bit, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I start off in the chapter that says, have you ever experienced a pain that hurts so deep that you wonder why is this happening to me? Mm-hmm. Have you ever experienced have you ever experienced agony so deep yet it is not a physical pain? Have you ever had pain so deep that you question is life really worth living? Mm-hmm. And then I go on to say that, um, this is my story about the two greatest people in my life, and those people are my kids. Mm. I apologize. I apologize. I apologize, Charles and Tanisha. I apologize for not being the father you needed me to be when you were hurting, for not being the father to come to your rescue when you needed to be rescued. I apologize for not being there to thwart the wrongdoing you would receive over your years. 
uh, I apologize and please forgive me. Mm. You know, so I kind of poured into that because over the last, you know, 16, 17 years, we've had it rough, you know, mm-hmm. as a pa- as a parent and children, you know, like I said, you know, we were divorced and divorce wasn't a good divorce. So mm-hmm. uh, I kind of go into that, give some details about what happens there. And that's going to be, um, uh, uh, I'm going to write the book. This is just a chapter. Mm. I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you, brother, when you, when you, when you read this, this, this book, you're going to be like, wow, really? Mm. It's, it's going to be those aha moments. But the book, When the Wall Speaks, 13 great men uh, pouring into this book, giving their experiences as fathers or as, as, as children, um, the, the thought process here is to uplift and motivate, inspire the next generation. It is to have a child read this book and say, wow, this happened to Coach T and I'm going through this. Man, I can make it. Mm. Man, Coach T's children had it rough. I'm having it rough. I can make it. I can do it. The other authors, there's uh, another author that uh, his dad died. Not only did his dad die, his dad died in his arms. Mm. Man, you know, went through a, a relationship thing and, you know, ultimately his dad was murdered. But before mm. he died, he was able to hold his dad in his arms. Man, that's deep. Mm. There's, another, there's another part in the chapter where um, the author is giving some statistics. He said back in 2019, there was 15.7 million single uh mother households mm-hmm. you know you know in some report and uh mother households and three point something million single parent father households so just just those numbers alone that don't quote me on the exact number yeah, but yeah, just just those numbers alone makes you think man all of these single parent single family households there's a problem there there's something mm-hmm. wrong there there was a, another chapter where the author is talking about um, uh, his parents splitting up and uh, for him to be the very best that he can be, the parents determined that it would be best for him to live with his father, you Ooh. know? Okay. And, 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 and then the, he goes on to say that be, living with his father has shaped him to be the father and the parent and the man he is today. And that's so deep, man. That is deep. Check this out. Check this, and it's interesting because it sounds mm. like you could have wrote that chapter too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm yeah. reading this, and I'm like, man, this, this is sounds me. like me too. You know what I mean? You, you, you know, it's interesting. And, and again, the book is titled "When the Walls Speak," and one of the co-authors is Coach T, aka Tyrell Richards Sr. Um, is the book currently available? It's available. You can uh, get the book from me mm-hmm. if you purchase from me. I will autograph it. Mm-hmm. Um, at C Richard S R at yahoo.com. C R I C H A R D S R at yahoo.com. Okay. It's a really good book. You guys can't go wrong. Once you read it, you'll be like, man, there's a lot of gems in this book. There's a lot of knowledge in here. Like I said, 13 fathers, mm-hmm. excuse me, 13 great men mm-hmm. uh, pouring into this book. There's a lot of different insights from different places. Um, there's a there's another one of the other authors grew up in a single family home with his mother. He was the mm-hmm. oldest of the children. Mm-hmm. And he goes on to say that he was uh, placed in positions of looking after his younger siblings. So he had to grow up, you know, grow up faster than really was needed. And, um, this, you know, hold on, don't tell the whole book now. Like this is this is I'm, this, giving, I'm giving a little bit. I'm giving a little that, bit. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good that's a good snippet because we want people to grab the book. And again, it's when the walls speak. And again, one of the co-authors is Tyrell Richard Sr. From he's from the Bay Area, currently living in San Diego. And if you want an autographed copy of it, make sure to email him at C Richard Sr. at yahoo.com. And I'll put that in the show notes. So if you want an okay. autographed copy, you can get directly from him, email him. He'll work out the details with you there. Um, is there any other way for people to learn more about you? Learn more about the book, any websites, anything. Yeah, I have a, I have a Facebook page, uh, Facebook uh, backslash Terrell Richards Senior. Okay. My name T Y R E L L R I C H A R D S R. And uh, I also have a Twitter page. Okay. So you know Twitter. 
Uh, I do YouTube videos as well. Um, so yeah, man, you know what? I have a real uh, calling. I've been telling, I've been telling my lady for years, for years. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know what? There's something bigger for me. There's something more for me. I like coaching, mm -hmm. but there's something more. There's Absolutely. something, there's something with this youth that I need to do. So what I'm doing now is I'm, you know, I'm writing, I'm writing a book. I'm currently working on two more books. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do the YouTube videos to inspire you. You know, look at my one one of videos. You you definitely be inspired. I try to point to him. I think there is a a void, and I don't want to knock our school systems, but I think there's a void. Whereas, um, for the most part, students do well. But then, what about that two, three, four percent that struggles? You mm -hmm. know, what about them? Do they just get left to the side? So I'm trying to to reach all students, and I'm trying to reach. Um, students that you know feel like you know hey what what am i here for you know mm -hmm. the ones that feel left behind you know you want to inspire those that feel like this isn't for them and give right. them a different angle a different perspective and also exactly. ultimately a different outlook which can lead to different outcomes and exactly. that's what this thing is all about different outlooks can lead to different outcomes and in a lot of instances, we need some different outcomes. So exactly. brother, brother, I salute you, man. And I'll make sure to have your information in the show notes. So if you all want to grab a copy of the book directly from him, you email him C Richards, C Rich Richards Sr. at yahoo.com. You can follow him on Facebook. I have a link to his Facebook page in the show notes, Tyrell Richards Sr. And the same thing on Twitter. Link up with him, connect with him, grab the book, When the Walls Speak um and man literally check this brother out man because he's going to do some amazing things he's already doing some amazing things but he's going to ramp this thing up because when he looks in the mirror he sees the man that he felt left a void but the reality is is fully embodied in who he is and what he does day in and day out and that's his father <laughs> All right. Well, brother, That's I appreciate it. you, man, for taking time to spend spend some spend some moments with us here on uh, Black Fathers Now. And, you know, just thank you and continue doing the great work, brother. Hey, Mike, I appreciate you having me, man. I'm blessed. You're blessed. Yes. Things are going to get better. We are going to uplift this next generation and we go get things fired up, man. Life That's is good. We are blessed. Love you, man. Thank you for having me on the show. No and uh, I'm looking I'm looking to be on the show again in the future, man. I yes. hope we can continue this relationship and uh, things will get better as things move on. Absolutely, man. We well, love you, too, man. I appreciate you. And definitely we'll have to do a round two at some point in the future when you drop in one of these other books. All right. All right, my man. Thank All right, you. brother. Thanks for having me, brother. Peace right, out. Fellas, no, pro no problem, my man. Fellas, ladies listening to, as always, make sure to follow Black Fathers Now on all social media platforms. Subscribe to the podcast via your favorite podcast listening app. Share this thing out. Make sure to get in contact with Tyrell Richard Sr. Grab a copy of the book, When the Walls Speak. Look for more stuff coming from the brother. If you're in the San Diego area, you're in a youth football arena, you've probably heard of Coach T. If so, run by, let him know that you heard about him more, or learn more about his story on Black Fathers Now. And until next time, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I'll holler at you. Peace. All right. Yeah. Yo, fellas, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And always, always, always visit blackfathersnow.com as well as follow Black Fathers Now on virtually every social media platform you can think of. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, everywhere. Just follow us and, uh, and engage with us, man. Look forward to hearing from you. And uh, I guess until next time, I'll holler at you. Peace.